righty. Well, hello. We're live on Facebook now. So hi to anyone who's watching this on Facebook, whether you're watching live now or watching uh, this recorded later on. This is going to be a really, really, really interesting conversation. And I want to say hi to anyone who's jumping on right now. Thank you for spending time with us today. Thank you for joining us. I can't wait uh, to both educate myself and to educate you guys on on um, the dirty dozen. So again, before we get started, I just want to say welcome to Airtime. It is brought to you by Elevate Aviation. And today I'm actually coming, I can see them, but you can't. I'm coming from the mountains out in Alberta. I'm in a little town called Crow's Nest Pass. And uh, it is beautiful out here. The sun is shining. And I'm talking to you guys with this amazing view right in front of me staring at some mountains. So it's a really great day for me. And I hope it's going to be a great day for you guys. Uh, before we get started today, I just want to shout out our junior jet program with Elevate Aviation. We do have a junior jet program. So if you have kids from about age five to 12 and you want to interest them in aviation, you can go to elevateaviation.ca and find our junior jet program. Uh, it's free for the kids. There's some videos on there. And if you know any teachers that want to take it into the classroom, uh, we can, uh, we actually have uh, people who will share them. They will share the videos and we'll have a pilot and air traffic controller and maintenance whatever you want uh, we can set up and and get the operational people to explain these videos to your class it is a lot of fun they spend about 90 minutes together and they really help educate the kids on aviation because we all know aviation is going to come back and it is a wonderful place to work so check out junior jets if you want to ask someone more information you can go to info at elevateaviation.ca okay today we are learning about how to avoid involuntary errors with The Dirty Dozen. Uh, the Dirty Dozen is not referring to the movie. <laughs> the Dirty Dozen refers to 12 of the most common human error preconditions or conditions that can act as precursors to accidents or incidents. These 12 elements influence people to make mistakes. The Dirty Dozen is a concept developed by Gordon DuPont in 1993 while he was working for Transport Canada and form a part of an elementary training program for human performance and maintenance. It has since become a cornerstone of human factors in maintenance training courses worldwide. Since 1993, all areas of the aviation industry, not just the maintenance part, have found the Dirty Dozen a useful introduction to open discussions into the human error in their business, organizations, and workplaces. So it may be possible to find the Dirty Dozen list for pilots, ramp workers, air traffic controllers, and cabin crew, and I'm sure more. Uh, I am so thrilled today to have our guest, Gordon DuPont, founder of the Dirty Dozen, and his daughter, Renee DuPont-Adam, CEO of System Safety Services. Hi, you guys. Thanks so much for being here. Well, good morning. Nice to be here. Our pleasure. This is uh, this is really exciting. As we were talking about earlier, um, I you know researching uh, before you guys came on and just uh, how eye-opening it was for me to really understand how much impact the Dirty Dozen has had. And, um, and so I'm really excited for you guys to tell us more about it, about your company, about what you're doing now. But first, let's start. Gordon, I want to start with you. Um, I have a question from Cassandra, a lady up, she's a maintenance worker up in Yellowknife and she couldn't be here today. And she sent me a question. It's a perfect question to get us started. So she wanted to know, um, she says, hi, Gordon. She said, you developed the Dirty Dozen in 1993 while working for Transport Canada. How did you come up with the concept? I, I was hired by Transport for, two, for a two year term leaving the Transportation Safety Board first thing I did was organize an industry liaison committee and we discussed uh, how we were going to go about this because I didn't want to just copy the CRM into uh, maintenance and uh, the military gave me a box that was about a foot high with paper that folds back and forth with the holes along the edges of I would guess about 1500 or more uh, at maintenance incidents that they had recorded. So I went through those and I threw out, uh, you know, cause of accident, stupidity, cause of accidents, laziness, <laughs> and came up with some of the, uh, these uh, that had uh, 
they looked at them properly, let's put it that way. And th with the committee, uh, we ended up with 12 of the uh, most common contributing factors to a person making the air that they certainly never intended to make. So you can thank the Canadian military for keeping an excellent record on every little nut and bolt that got misplaced or done wrong. Well, but it, it's pretty interesting though that you went through that and out of that came these 30 dozen that has now turned into so much more. <laughs> yeah, I usually well, tell people, I just look at all the errors I made, but uh, that <laughs> heard the actual fact. <laughs> wow, so um, what is your history? Like, I started did you up, always I, love aviation? Yeah, well, I started out, uh, I, I volunteered for the missions in New Guinea in 1960. And in 1961, when they were donated an airplane, we built an airstrip in the middle of the jungle. And I got volunteered to learn to fly a Cessna 185 with a cargo pod. And so 35 hours later, I was flying over the jungle. And if you don't believe there's somebody else looking after you upstairs, I tell you, there was many times when I said, Lord, it's in your hands because I don't know where the hell I am. <laughs> and so I, from pilot, I came back to Canada and uh, wanted to know more about maintenance. Uh, that was after I had landed after two and a half hours over the jungle and the oil plug fell out. Uh, so um, I went into maintenance and decided, well, maintenance is actually a much safer way to do things, but I had intended to go back to New Guinea at the time. And from there, I, I worked at many different companies, including CPR. I had signing authority on the 747. So I got to know a lot of airplanes. I was then got into, uh, I was a d director of maintenance for a corporate aircraft and then went to accident investigation, which was very interesting. The only problem is it's very reactive. So when Transport Canada was looking for someone to develop uh, human factors for maintenance, I jumped at the thing and uh, sort of went from there. Oh. So you, you didn't go through the normal training to become a pilot. You were over there and basically- That's right. They're like, That's right. you need to figure this out. Yeah, well, we, I spent, uh, I guess about 30 hours flying uh, with a, a priest uh, from a different mission uh, who showed me how to fly the thing. In those days uh, in New Guinea in particular, there was no uh, formal licensing and that sort of thing. It was the Wild West without the West. That's crazy. And now, now look what you do. So looking <laughs> back on that, it was probably like, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe that wasn't the best, but you knew that at the time anyway. That's crazy. Well, wow. I learned a lot. I learned a lot about aviation in that time. Like, so we're, oh, sorry. Yeah, keep going. I wasn't bulletproof. That's the first thing <laughs> I had to learn. <laughs> wow. Wow, that sounds like quite the adventure. Yeah, it, it was. Uh, like I said, there was more than once when I had said, Lord, it's in your hands because <laughs> I'd run out of options. But you learn. Wow. I have kept learning even up to today. Sounds to me like there needs to be a movie made about your life. <laughs> uh, I, I keep telling him he needs to write a book. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I vote for that. I'll yeah. buy a copy, so there, one copy is sold. Yeah. And, and we'll have him sign it for you. Yeah. Okay, okay, I'll be waiting. I'll, I'll be waiting. Christmas is a good time. I like Christmas gifts. Yeah. <laughs> you better start writing there, Dad. Right yeah. yeah. So, Renee, what, what got, so obviously, you know, I'm assuming your dad got you into your line of work, but how, like, how did that happen? Because, you know, not, not all children want to follow in their father's footsteps, so there must have been some passion there. Uh, well, when I, I was born in Papua New Guinea, so I, wow. I was flying when I was only a few weeks old, and, you know, I was always daddy's little girl, and he had a hanger out in the backyard, and, you know, I would go out there and hand him wrenches and pay attention to what he was doing, and it just seemed natural to follow in his footsteps. Wow. So how long did you live there? I was only three weeks old when we left New Guinea. When you left. Okay. So you're, Wow. 
So, yeah, it, it was difficult as a child. You know, all the kids would say, I was born in Toronto, I was born in Vancouver, and I'd say, I was born in New Guinea. <laughs> they go, what? <laughs> so I was called a New Guinea pig. <laughs> oh. oh, that's crazy. Okay, I have another question for C Cassandra that I want to uh, throw yeah. out there. So she says, um, so Gordon, she was still talking to you, and she says, uh, you were a technical investigator for the ASB before your position at Transfer Canada, where you saw the results of maintenance and human error. Fast forward 30 years, and I'm sure you guys can both comment on this. What are some of the differences uh, that you see in the role of maintenance that has had on aircraft accidents, you know, from then till now? Well, in uh, quite as we might call them the good old days, but back then uh, you couldn't really look at human factors. If I wrote human factors into a, uh, uh, an accident, the they board would come back and say, you don't know what he was thinking, take it out. Uh, today we realize that uh, the human, when he makes an error, does not intend to do it. So let's take a look at what it was influencing his thinking. So in the 30 years, we finally started to look at the human as well as going back beyond pilot error. And that used to be the end of the story. Uh, we now go back and find out what were the uh, contributing factors that influenced him making the whatever error it is that was made. So there's been a lot of change and positive change and finally looking at the human and trying and saying, why in the devil did he do it? And he'll look at you and say, I haven't a clue why I did that. So then you find out he's been working 16 hour days for the last month up north because the sun shines 24 hours and, and so on. Does that help? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, you know, I'm an air traffic controller. And so there's incidents that happen in air traffic control. Um, and you know, they do look into you know, they even have a sleep question. How much sleep did you get mm -hmm. in the past week or the past night or whatever the question is? And um, I guess trying to dig into the human factor side of why that incident happened. Really interesting. But usually fatigue's number one, by the way, out of the 12 dirty dozen people will ask, well, what's the number one? I say fatigue. And people aren't aware as they become tired, they begin to develop a don't care attitude. They're not aware of it, but it's there. Is it, do you think it's fatigue from, is, does shift work have a lot to do with that fatigue or, or not really? Uh, I think, uh, you know, yeah. there's a multitude of things that will contribute to the fatigue. And it's not ever one, just one dirty dozen. You know, they say, ah, fatigue. Well, no, what about stress? What about, you know, the communication? Did they have correct communication? And, and distractions, a biggie that I, I found where you get distracted and the problem being that uh, you, uh, when you're distracted, you think you're farther ahead than you are unless you have something visual to bring you back to reality, which in most cases does happen. But in 15% of the cases in accidents, it doesn't. So that's where you quote, forget. So um, Caleb's asking, he said, I looked up the dirty dozen. Each of the 12 ideas makes sense, except I would like clarification on number 12. Will you explain what number 12 norms is referring to? But Renee, I think you have a, a PowerPoint that's going to go through yeah. them all. Why don't we do the PowerPoint and then uh, that question may be answered in that. And, and okay. if it's well, not answered, it. <laughs> if it doesn't get answered, uh, we can certainly elaborate more on it after. Right. Okay, yeah, so just make sure you can share it there. Hopefully you'll be able to. Uh, yes. Nothing can go wrong. Oh, well, everything can go wrong. Let's start. Okay. Um, can you see my screen? Nope. Well, it says my screen is being shared. There you go, you got it, you got it. Excellent. Okay, so can we see it now? Yeah, it looks Perfect. good. All right, so let's start, dive into our presentation. Sorry, I just can't see my screen. There we go. So who we are. Yeah. Okay, System Safety Services, we've been in business since 1999, and Gordon has been in aviation himself since 1961. 
Excuse me, hello. Uh, after working seven years with the Transportation Safety Board, Gordon noticed that 80 to 90% of all accidents were due to the human and were repeated over and over and over again. And thus he joined Transportation or Transport Canada to develop the first human factors workshop and the Dirty Dozen. And I joined the company in 2006 after being in aviation for a lifetime, starting at the age of three weeks. So our objective, oh, sorry, my phone is just running off the hook. Oh, no. okay. So our objective, we're simply going to introduce you to why we make errors. We lost your screen sharing. Uh-oh. I don't know. This technology thing. Yeah, it always works great until sometimes. Okay, let's try this again. Share screen. Let's go back to here. And share. How about that? Yeah, there we go. We're yeah. back in action. Oh, fantastic. All right. Okay, so our objective today is we're simply going to introduce you to why we make errors. I'm going to provide you some insight on more important how to avoid you can avoid making that error all right so what is human error human error is whenever the outcome of something we did or didn't do is not what we expected there's a human error about to occur <laughs> the outcome is not what he's expecting so the error is human but not with aircraft they don't apply that so the good news is human error is not the cause of accidents. Nope. Causes are to be found in whatever it was that interfered with the guilty party's performance or judgment at a critical moment. Why did he make that decision to make that error, even though he didn't realize he was going doing so? And the outcome or the result of that is the human error. All right. So we've... Uh, Human error is actually responsible for at least 80% of aviation accidents. And I think it was lately that Boeing is saying it's actually more like 90% now, not just 80%. Yeah. And you can be sure that those errors are never intentional. If they're intentional, it's sabotage. It's not an error. <laughs> and many people who make an error have no idea in the first place why they made that error. Right. And it's simply lack of knowledge of what causes you to make the error is a contrib major contributing factor. You have never been trained on how to avoid making a human error, except tell you told, be careful. That covers everything, right? And human factors training gives you that all important knowledge. All right. So let's talk about the factors that cause us to make an error. So what sets us up to make the errors that we don't intend to make? And most important, how do we prevent that error? All right. So the dirty dozen, number one is a lack of communication. We lost the sound. Well. No sound? Oh, there it is. <laughs> so there's better way, better way to get instructions. He's not finished with them. <laughs> so what you had there was definitely a lack of communication. And it's a failure to successfully exchange information Certainly applied there. And Covey said it very well. We got to seek first to understand, then we can open our mouth and be try to be understood. And you need to ensure that the mental pictures match. When we have a conversation, I have a picture in my head, and I'm assuming that you have the same picture in your head. Quite often that doesn't happen. Right. And of course, uh, you learned how to do paraphrasing, repeat back in a slightly different way or ask questions. Some cultures are very prone to saying the answer that they think you want, not necessarily what's happening or what's true. All right, number two, complacency. 
Mm-hmm. Don't know why our sound drops. But you don't need sound for this one. So complacency is simply the self-satisfaction resulting in a loss of awareness of the dangers. When you've done something over and over and over so many times, you start to lose the awareness of the dangers. The greater the competency of the person, the more likely it is that uh, this contributing factor may occur. When you think I can do this job with my eyes closed, that's almost what you end up doing without realizing it. And the person will begin to see and hear what they expect to see and hear. A very dangerous one. Awareness is probably one of the key factors in reducing this air. All right, number three is lack of knowledge. <laughs> James was with our company for 10 years before this tragic accident. <laughs> what are you talking about? Your company never fully trained me to deal with high voltage wires. And the way they were insulated, it was obvious someone wanted to get home in a hurry. What was I thinking? Not wearing all of my safety equipment. The lack of knowledge is simply a lack of understanding or having experience for the task at hand can occur at any stage though of your work career or what with constant changes that occur. And training is always a safety net and good investment. Of course, we're biased on that, but it's true. All right, number four, distraction. Distraction is anything that takes your mind off of the task at hand. Responsible for 15% of all human errors and all act, aviation accidents. And it's the number one cause of forgetting. Yeah. Our mind can work faster than our hands. And that's the big thing you got to keep in mind in mind at all times when you're distracted. Distraction can be a coffee break, right? Any of that. And we're always thinking ahead and what we're not aware of is when we come back to the task, you will think you're farther ahead than you actually are unless there's something to visually bring you there. There was a study done, they took a bunch of students and they had to build these, a project with building blocks in a numbered sequence step. So step one, you take the yellow to the red, et cetera. And they stopped them in the middle and went for coffee. And then before they went back, they said, at what step were you at when you went for coffee? Every single one of them said they were one to three steps farther ahead than they actually were because of this simple thing called distraction. Something takes your mind off, even for a short period of time, because our mind is, works faster than the hands, they end up thinking that uh, they're farther ahead and that has caused many accidents. Thank goodness visual, uh, you know, you get back to reality with visual and you're not aware of it. But it's something you got to always remember whenever you're distracted, your mind works faster than your hands. All right. 
Then we have number five, lack of teamwork. Some good teamwork. Yeah, yes. The lack of teamwork is simply a failure to seek or consider the input of others. Becomes more common as a company grows and gets larger. Teamwork becomes more difficult. And it calls for trust, a common goal, and communication amongst the entire team, from everyone from the CEO down to the janitor. They're all part of the same team. Those crabs had all three of those. <laughs> and it's a must for any SMS to function properly or to succeed. Because safety management system or SMS, and that calls for teamwork. People have to be willing to trust that uh, the common goal is something that they believe in. And of course, some more important, they gotta communicate. If they see a problem or they almost have made an error, that they communicate. So SMS depends on teamwork. All right, number six, the big one, fatigue. So fatigue is a loss of alertness and a feeling of tiredness that it will eventually end in sleep. And we don't often think about it, but if we don't sleep, we die. You do need sleep. And the Guinness Book of World Records for the person who stayed the wake the longest, I believe, was 11 days. And on day 11, he felt that his blood pressure had dropped so low, he thought things were crawling on him and they called it. And that's when people decided that this fatigue thing was really a bit of an issue. Number one contributor to human error. We're not aware of it, but it's always there in the background if we start to get tired. And the industry tends to underestimate the problem. And it's really in the last 10, 15, 20 years that we've started to hear about a fatigue management system. You know, thinking back 20 years ago, when you were on the hangar floor, they didn't care how long you had been there. You stay until that job gets done. They didn't take the fatigue into consideration. And we, the individual, tended to overestimate our ability to deal with it. I'll be okay. And your head's snapping up and down, back and forth. Right, so that's been a major problem with the fatigue. We don't accept what it can do to us. Basically, the more fatigued you become, the greater the feeling of I don't care attitudes starts to get stronger and stronger. And they do say that most car accidents happen within five kilometers of your home. And that's because people are pushing themselves. You know, you're tired on that after working a long night shift, you're driving home, you're really close to home and you feel the eyes starting to close, but you think I can make it. And that's when you fall asleep and the accidents happen. All right, so moving on, number seven, lack of resources. Don't know what the problem is with our sound. Company should have replaced that ladder years ago. I knew I shouldn't have reached over like that. And why isn't there a strict policy about two people doing a job like this? So lack of resources, it's a lack of material or support to safety to safely carry out the task at hand. It's not uncommon when times get tough or like COVID shows up, right? And you call upon people to do more with less. 
there's limits to that. And you have to learn how to say no, especially if it's going to affect safety. And in many cultures, that is really difficult for people to learn to do, to learn to say no. Number eight, pressure. Uh, aviation doesn't have pressure. None. Uh, when we asked Reebok to send us Terry Tate, some people thought we were crazy. But I'm a firm believer in paradigm breaking, outside the box thinking. Hey, man. Wait, was over 15 minutes ago, Mesh! And since Terry's been with us, our productivity has gone up 46%. Getting more from our employees than ever before. You know you need a cover sheet on your TPS reports, Bridget! That ain't new, baby! Hey, Janice! But what's really impressed me is how Terry's become part of the Felcher family. <laughs> he fits right in. Just alone, this is all, Doug. To be honest, I wish Reebok sent us ten Terry Tates. <laughs> you want to play games, Gene? Well, when it's game time, it's pay time, baby. Whoa! So there you go. That was serious pressure. The pressure, the urgency of matters requiring immediate attention. Interestingly, most of the pressure is self-pressure. You're not aware of it, but you put a lot of pressure on yourself to complete something when you really are not uh, in a position to do so. And training must provide a model to help you recognize the true source of the pressure. Certainly helps. All right, moving on, number nine, lack of assertiveness. I was just going to walk away and give up. Stop it. You can get that. That's yours. Nobody else. Get in there and give it some heat. Give it some heat. The lack of assertiveness, failing to act in a bold and confident manner on safety concerns. Yeah, it's caused a lot of accidents. I've gone to accidents where one person actually had knowledge, knew that, that one day that was going to happen, and yet they did not speak up and say something. It's not my job. They lack the assertiveness to say, hey, we're going to have a problem here one day. And uh, it's sad, it makes you angry actually that uh, that lack of assertiveness contributes to fatalities. And it can be difficult to achieve in some cultures. There are cultures where you do not question authority. So to be assertive enough to speak up to somebody in that kind of culture is really, really difficult. Uh, we were over in Singapore for the Air Force and that was one of their major issues. They just knew that they weren't supposed to question authority. So to get them, when they saw something that wasn't quite right, to get them to speak up was very difficult. We spend a lot of time on assertiveness. And in the end, the, uh, the head person actually gave everybody a card, which we helped them make up that said, if you see something that's not right, it is your duty and responsibility to speak up and their accident rate went down quite a bit because of that. All right, stress. Uh, that one's a B. Keep looking. Thanks, 
There was one guy there that really needed more stress. The other had more than his share. <laughs> so what is stress? It's a subconscious response to the demands placed upon it. Person often brings a stressor to work with them. And the problem with stress is your mind is on the stressor and not on your work, or can be anyhow. And your mind is never fully on the job because when you get to work, your mind is on the stressor. And that is the difference between stress and pressure. Pressure is usually something you acquire at work. Stress yeah. is something you bring with you to work. All right. All right, let's so let's talk a little more about stress. Okay, it's one of what we call the big four, the four big ones in the dirty dozen, along with lack of communication, fatigue, and lack of teamwork. Those are what we call the big four. And when we teach our uh, initial human factors training courses two days long, we spend a lot of time on those four items. That's one day. And stress has resulted in hundreds of unnecessary fatalities over the years. And COVID-19 is the title of the number one stressor of 2020. And I'm actually starting to think it could be the number one stressor of 2021 as well. <laughs> Let's have a look at that. So day after day, you turn on the news, oh man, and all you can see is news like this. 40 airlines have failed so far this year and more are set to come. American Airlines weighs off 32,000 employees. They've actually brought some back, thank goodness. But it's hard to believe that 17,000 airplanes were parked. I guess an air traffic controller would realize that because <laughs> they're not in the air. And these are some of the stressors. Will I have a job tomorrow? Will we be in for another lockdown? Oh boy. Yeah. How is our son going to support his family? And will our daughter have to move back home? Oh, good God, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> right on. And do we have enough toilet paper? There's a major stressor. Uh, that seemed to be the number one stressor of 2020. <laughs> At least to start with. And on and on and on it goes. So stress is the body's response to the demands placed upon it. But Gordon and I actually think it's more the subconscious response to the demands placed upon it. Be a little more specific. We have a model here adapted from a stress curve. Well, it was actually called an arousal curve back in 1908. So we adapted it. And you got stress going across the bottom. As stress increases, performance increases, as you can see, as you go up that curve. By the way, you see down at the bottom there, danger one, low stress, low performance. We've already covered that one. In fact, it was number two. For those that uh, can remember, anyone have any idea what it was? You can do it with your eyes closed. You've done it hundreds of times. Don't even have to think about it when you do the performance. Low stress, low performance. Anyone remember the word? Complacency, right on. And there's where it is on that curve. So you got the go-go stress, the good stuff, right? but it only goes up so far. Then it sort of flattens out a bit and you got the so-so stress. That's the high achievers that work day and night, take no time off, but you can't stay up there forever. And if your stress can, continues, it go, takes a steep downhill slide right into the distress, the, the, and the uh, depression, depression. depression. leads to nervous breakdowns, and PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is actually stress. And it can even lead to suicide. It has in a lot of cases, right? So. so excess stress can certainly be bad news. So what can we do about it? Because we're all going to have this thing called stress in our lives. Some of it's good. Okay. You got a man there, he's holding a glass in his hand, right? It's got water in it, uh, half full. You think the man could hold that out there for what? Five minutes? I think no problem. 10 minutes, probably no problem at all. How about an hour? 
think the glass might start to get more and more heavy. It might start to come down. Well, if we take that water and replace it with stress, it's exactly the same thing. If you can only handle stress for a certain period of time, it starts to weigh you down. What if that man, when he had the water, was to hold it for 50 minutes, put it down for 10 minutes, and then go and pick it up again? Could he hold it for the day, doing that every hour? I almost guarantee he could. And it's the same thing with stress. You have that glass of stress, you have to let go of that stress every now and again. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. So what can we do about stress? Number one is have a hobby. You know, having a hobby allows you, your mind to get off the stressor while you're working on that hobby. It's just like Gordon mentioned, the glass of water. It's putting that stress or glass of water down while you work on your hobby. But drinking, that's not a good hobby. <laughs> right. Taking a holiday, even if it's a holiday from hell, the kids are screaming and hollering and the car breaks down, it's still a change from the stress and it still is a break. That's why we insist on people taking holidays and breaks, weekends and that. It's to get away from the stressor. Many vacation can be just going to a movie, but you wanna take the right movie. Don't go to something like Sinner's List where you come out of it feeling worse than when you went in. So Disney is pretty safe. And uh, meditation or practice your faith. Talk to someone, right? By talking to it, you help keep it in a conscious mind and it can help relieve the stress. And write things down and work on what you have control of. To write things down, especially in an ordered number, it allows you to get it off your mind and onto the paper and you can make a lot more sense out of it. Because quite often our stressors are things that we have absolutely no control over, such as COVID-19. We had no control over that. But we do have control on how we can try and avoid it. And here's a biggie, have a pet, right? But you gotta choose the right one. That's not the right pet. <laughs> There's our stress relievers, right? These are the right pets. <laughs> yeah, they come and tell us at 10 o'clock, it's time to take us for a walk. <laughs> uh, of course, the bubble wrap's a stress reliever too. If you spend some time popping the bubbles, it takes your mind off of the stressor for a little bit. And here's a big one, exercise. Okay, exercise definitely has its benefits. It's an excellent means of putting that glass of stress down. Uh, I myself am a marathon runner and I've ran 43 half marathons and one full marathon. And that's a lot of training involved, but it is so good for the stressors. I put my music in on one ear and I'm gone. And I can work through all sorts of stress by having that exercise. Another benefit it improves your resilience, your ability to cope with the stress. There was a study done involving rats, okay? And they were stressed by having electrical shocks given to them every night, any time. They never knew when they were suddenly going to be shocked. So they would be pretty stressed. However, half the rats had an exercise wheel in their cage. The other half had no nothing, right? And the rats voluntarily got into the exercise wheel and actually ran on it. There they are, right? And it was found that the rats that had the exercise wheel and exercise were less stressed, even though they were still getting the shocks same as the others, than the ones that had no exercise wheel but had to just sit there and wait for the shocks. So they decided, let's try this on humans. I think that should. And so what they did, they weren't going to shock them and that humans, that's inhumane. So they had them in a room that would suddenly turn or tilt. Okay, so they're sitting there doing that or standing or whatever they're doing and suddenly the room would tilt or it would spin. So they never knew when that was going to happen. Now half of them got to exercise and those that exercised were less stressed out. I think that because they're like that glass of stress 
when you're exercising, your mind is at least away from the, the stressor for that short time, and they were much better able to cope with it. They discovered that exercise produces a, a protein I never heard of called gallatin in the brain, which helps serve to calm the mind. So it's an interesting thing. Exercise is a big thing besides keeping the weight down and the body trim. <coughs> All right, uh, so sometimes it's called the law of attraction. With positive thinking is simple. Think positive and positive things will happen to you. Much easier said than done, but the following are five steps that can help you do that. Take time to be thankful for what we have. Each and every one of us has something in our lives to be thankful for. We don't live outside in a wet tent uh, we still have usable hands and feet. We have a roof over our head. Every single person should realize that we have so much still to be grateful for. Step two is set out to improve and do better for yourself every day. Say, okay, I'm pretty good off, but I could do better. Where can I undo it? Set a goal, right? Because Napoleon Hill said, whatever the mind of man can conceive and believe, it can achieve. All right, step three, uh, take time to laugh. Laughter is so important because they say 15 minutes of laughter per day can add years to your life. So Gordon and I are hoping that when you see our little video clips, that we've maybe added some time to your life because you're getting that 15 minutes of laughter. And it was Mother Teresa that said, inner peace begins with a smile. I like that. Yeah. And here's a big one too for positive thinking is give back to others. In actual fact, when you give to others, you actually gain yourself as well. And I, I can't emphasize that too much. We were in Singapore and there was a little lady when we went into the college where we're doing the training, she'd see us coming and she'd get out of the way and stand back there. And it just stopped and said, you know, you do a very good job here. After that, she was smiling away every time we came and we became friends, even though uh, we never really spoke uh, that much. I'm not even sure she understood English, but uh, uh, just that kind word is giving to somebody and it can make their day. And number five is to do it and keep doing it until it becomes a habit. We can all do better, but when we help others, we're also helping ourselves. That is so true. So if life has started to become, the stress has become like an eight track in your head that's going around and around and around and feel that there's no relief from that stress, you need to stop and get professional help. Okay, most, most companies nowadays have what they call an employee assistance program where you can get some free counseling. And I can't stress how important that is. You got to do something, right? You can't keep doing the same thing you've always been doing and think that somehow something's going to change, right? So you have to say, I'm feeling overwhelmed with this and that get some help. And help is pretty well nowadays. I don't think it's uh, that difficult uh, to get that mental help if that's what you need. All right, continuing on. Number 11 is lack of awareness. This has fractured the food in a Given well, Saturday, so we can be able to go on tomorrow. Daddy's going to be so excited. Uh -huh. Children. Paging Dr. Palmer, <laughs> Dr. Barbara Palmer, dial 452. So a lack of alertness and vigilance in observing. Usually occurs to the very experienced. If we look at that cartoon that's up there, that's actually on one of our uh, dirty dozen posters, the lack of awareness. There's a fire extinguisher on the uh, bulkhead there that circled. There was a man who had 35 years experience when this aircraft was brought up from the military and civilianized here. 
the regulation said put a fire extinguisher in the cabin area where the passengers can see it. So he put it on a bulkhead, not realizing that uh, somebody sitting there in the event of an accident was going to take it off that bulkhead with his face. And that's exactly what happened. And when I talked to the man, I said, why in hell did you put it there? He said, it seemed like a good idea at the time. And it was approved by Transport Canada. They'd sent in the pictures, of course, and the drawings and the testing. So that was a classic lack of awareness. Somebody with all that 35 years of experience was unaware of what, was, uh, the, what he was doing was going to cause an accident. And believe they're, these people believe they're doing the right thing, but they haven't thought it all the way through. You know, like we mentioned the fire extinguisher, how do you thought if there's an accident, will this be in the way? Unfortunately, he never did have that thought. Yeah. If you're not at all sure, ask somebody else. Somebody to say, what is, you know, is this a good idea? And they may look at it and say, yeah, but what if somebody's sitting in front of that, right? So more what ifs. And number 12, norms. Ah. pressure, desire to fit in are major influences of norms. Norms are not all negative, but uh, certainly they, they're done. And uh, we spend a fair amount of time on this when we do the workshop. But it's unwritten rules that everybody does, even sometimes they don't even know why they do it anymore, uh, that uh, they're neg if they're negative can cause and do cause accidents. Unfortunately, uh, you can see in the picture there, there's an aircraft where 271 people are about to die in the circled picture there. And the norm had become they would remove the, when they did an engine change uh, or they had to replace the bushings up in the wing, uh, they would remove the engine and the pylon as one piece and then they would put it back on. Now that engine weighs 13,000 pounds. Would you like to be the forklift driver who is asked to raise the engine another 16th of an inch so we can put this bolt in? And what was happening is they couldn't control that enough and they would damage the uh, fittings. And when the fitting broke, of course, the engine came off. Now that shouldn't have caused the uh, plane to crash, but the pilots were unaware they had, quote, actually lost the engine. And when they took the aircraft as they'd been trained to best angle of climb speed, the leading edge slats had all retracted on that wing. And so that on that one wing, of course, and so the aircraft uh, swung, uh, what became, that wing stalled and you can see it there just before it crashes. That had become a norm. The manufacturer said, remove the engine, then remove the pylon, because that way the pylon was right at the center of gravity and you could easily control it. But they had developed the norm to say 44 man hours and it resulted in 271 people dying. And as we mentioned, not all norms are negative. There are positive norms within companies as well. Such and as having somebody double check your work Mm -hmm. Maybe not written that it, it needs to be, but you ask somebody to double check it anyway. That is a positive norm. Any questions, thoughts, or comments? Here's your chance. Okay. 
Um, we want to thank you guys for asking us to come today online uh, to show you about a little bit about the Dirty Dozen. And we'd like to offer anybody who watches us a 10% discount uh, on our store if you'd like to get a set of the Dirty Dozen. We do have some safety videos as well. If you go onto our website, you'll see them all there. And here is the code, and I believe they'll be posting this as well on, on the Facebook account. There's the code, and there's our website. No questions? Okay. Oh, yeah, norms. Did we answer the person who were norms? It's short. Yeah. Well. <laughs> That's all it is. This is normal. Yeah, Caleb, if you have more questions on that, um, now that you heard the presentation, please throw it out there if you have a, a specific question. Um, and we'll definitely put up this code and the website on the Facebook as well when this is taken down. Um, it, this is recorded on Facebook Live, so we'll put it on there as well. Um, and um, you guys, one of our, one of the guys who watch us all the time, he usually has his class watch. I don't know if his class is watching right now from Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, he's made a comment here. Hi, Trevor. Uh, he says that I used the Dirty Dozen in my HF class at the University of Trinidad and Tobago Aviation Campus. So glad to see Gordon DePoint in person since uh, I've been talking so much about him. I wish we could uh, have him and Renee visit the campus. I hope I can get his contact. So um, Trevor, why don't you throw your email in there and maybe Renee or Gordon can grab it and yeah. they'll reach out to you perhaps. Would that be okay, Renee? Oh, for sure. And he can always reach out to us on our website too. Both of our email addresses are there as well. What, okay. One thing I could add to it uh, is that um, I write for a, a maintenance magazine down in the States called the Director of Maintenance or DOM, D-O-M. Anybody can sign it up for it. It's free. Uh, but I've been doing that for seven years. If you go to our website, go to articles and then DOM, D-O-M, and you will find, uh, I guess there's what, about 50 of them up there now? Yeah. Yeah. Articles, yeah. Yeah, so they, I put them out every, I write every month uh, an article on human air. So, uh, and I guarantee you, if it, even if it's a boring reading, at least it's got a cartoon to start with. So, ah. <laughs> get the <part>. videos. <laughs> videos are so good. The, um, Renee, can you stop sharing just for a sec? Oh, yes. Okay, perfect. Just I want to I want to see your faces before before we say goodbye. Um, the videos uh, that the soccer one for Norms at the end. I was like, where is this going? I, I didn't know where that one was going. So funny. And my favorite of all of them was Terry for the pressure. Oh yeah. Uh, Reebok him. <laughs> we are pressuring pressuring everyone to, to get work done. They, what a way to what a way to help uh, explain it and teach it. And uh, it was it was it was so good. Um, okay, we're out of time. Uh, I, so I'm just going to thank you guys so much for this presentation. This was so good. I hope many, many people watch it. Um, it's so good. And we spoke at the beginning before this started about having you guys come back and having a, uh, a longer presentation and diving deeper into some of these things, maybe looking at accidents and what went wrong and, and different sort of things. So the one question I wanna ask before you go really quickly here is, um, how concerned are you about the COVID recovery in the aviation industry? Very concerned. The, the fact is that it's, it's a stressor, it's a big stressor, and they're gonna be coming back to work with a stressor. And secondly, their lack of not, their knowledge is not going to be the same as it was. Uh, so that they're, they, they're going to have to learn certain things. Uh, I think that if there was ever a time when they needed a refresher in human factors, including stressor, which by the way, we normally take a full hour on, but we thought that that was the one that we'd spend a little more time on in order to uh, uh, you know, get the awareness that, hey, I've got to be extra careful right now because I've been away from this I'm not the same as I was a year or a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, and, and they're finding too that, um, or particularly with pilots, of course, because they're the first people in the first line to make, <laughs> make errors, uh, that um, they're having problems with pilots that are not, as they say, up the snuff or mm -hmm. normally it would not be a problem becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we spoke a little bit earlier about the ATC side as well. And, you know, yeah. what that's going to look like as we get busy again. Well, it's going to be interesting over the next year as COVID sort of, you know, as the traffic starts to come back to see, see what happens. So I'm glad that you guys are out there, um, you know, talking about this. And we, I think we need to keep talking about it. Uh, Ginny, I want to say hi to you. Thanks for watching. Ginny was on our master class and she's very much, um, you know, um, talking about safety and, and she's really interested in this. So um, I imagine that uh, Ginny, we're going to be diving into the subject a little deeper too. So you probably want to come back. So you guys, um, Gordon and Renee, thank you. I'll reach out to you both and right. we'll talk about getting you back and, and diving deeper. I think this is so important, especially where we are right now. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you You're so very much. Welcome. Thank you very much for having us. It, it was our pleasure and we look forward to talking with you again soon. Enjoy. Yeah. The yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to go outside and enjoy the beautiful Mount. Oh, it's so beautiful, you guys. And uh, we'll touch base soon and we'll get you back on and we'll do something more. So thank you so much. Sounds great. Okay. Take care. Okay. Thank you, bye, everybody, everybody, for watching. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.